So, hi. So we are back after having looked at uh, this uh, wonderful painting by Rembrandt on the anatomy and lesson of uh, Dr. Taup, which we just examined. I thought it would be interesting now to take a few moments to look at the reality of how uh, death at itself has been depicted in art. And um, this is a very uh, delicate task, and it has been a kind of important responsibility for the church and uh, artists over the centuries. And since death is, of course, an inevitable reality, um, doctors, medical doctors, have a sacred task uh, in helping souls to face this sacred reality with courage and with supernatural vision. I understand that we are in a you know, multicultural society and very secularized, but the Church, of course, has always encouraged us all to think about death and to prepare for it. And the key is to prepare for it, uh, not to be afraid of it, Okay, in that light, the Church encourages us to think about death and to prepare for it in order to truly be ready, to be in the state of grace and to be ready for that moment in which God will, will judge our soul because the judgment is coming in the very moment in which we die. So the, the Church, in order to do that, has helped faithful throughout the centuries, so much so that it has even been called a form of art, which is called in Latin, ars moriendi, ars moriendi, the, the art of dying. It's an art form to die well, to die happily in the state of grace. Really, that's the most important thing in our life, to die in the state of grace. So the Church has done this at times by depicting the Last Judgment, in the tympanums of uh, churches, so that even entering into the very church was like a kind of a judgment, especially for pilgrims that had traveled a long way to go to some famous uh, pilgrimage church or, or basilica or something, especially in France, this was the case. They would see the last judgment and they would like prepare themselves to cross the threshold of the church. But one aspect of the what we call the Ars Moriendi, the, the art of dying, is that the church has sought to accompany the faithful and to help them to give an account. Uh, and this is done through this, uh, through this fine-tuned art that she has perfected through the centuries, through her sacraments, through her teaching, eh, and through the pastoral attention to the faithful. And one of the expressions of that uh, is these uh, manuals uh, that probably started around the 15th century, I would say around 1466 or so, we see some of the earliest manuals on the art of dying. And this is, I mean, there are probably earlier ones, but as far as I know, those are some of the earliest ones. And this is so in deeply important that we bring that art back today, especially now when the sacredness of life has been lost, especially that key moment. Eh? And many people today, especially with the pandemic, have died quite uh, alone, quite uh, discouraged, abandoned uh, by others. And that's, I would say, one of the more tragic uh, elements of the pandemic, eh? that, that is so many people were just left alone to die, right, like that. And, and so without help, without the comfort of loved ones. Eh? And, uh, and so this art of dying really essentially is the art of accompanying souls in those last moments of their life, right? And um, it's not, like, as we know, the vocabulary of our legislation here as a medical assistance, right, in dying uh, has deceived people into thinking that uh, they're just uh, facing a simple procedure, right, and uh, and they are kind of lulled into a kind of a dreamlike world without having really a, a good chance to give an account of their life. And so, for centuries, the Church has prepared souls for that important moment. And I think some of this came about through the tragedy of the Black Death, 
right? Uh, which, uh, of course, you know, took away, I don't know, thousands or millions of people in the 14th century. And uh, these plagues that uh, just ravaged uh, all of Europe. And um, so, as I mentioned, uh, some of the earliest manuals were dated to the mid-15th uh, century, 1460s or so, probably earlier. And um, they would be done in the form of a text, uh, a kind of poetic text, uh, helping people. But also, uh, they were accompanied by woodcuts, beautiful woodcuts, um, that would illustrate the kind of common man who's lying in bed and he's about to die, right? And the purpose of these woodcuts was to inspire people against uh, despair. And they would probably cut out these woodcuts and they would place it in front of the of the dying person right? at a moment in which he's going back and forth, oscillating between virtue and vice, right? And he's, he's on his deathbed and, and the church invites him or her, of course, to choose uh, virtue. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> in this uh, beautiful woodcut here, made by an anonymous artist, we see, of course, the images of the saints who had their own problems and their vices, even their own reasons, maybe, for despairing. Right? So look at this one here. We see here uh, Mary Magdalene, who holds uh, the, the anointing, the, the balm that she was going to anoint our Lord with, so that immediately identifies her as Mary Magdalene. And we know, you know, she, she kind of converted, she turned to our Lord. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, St. Peter. You see here very clear the image of the, of the rooster there, right? That's, that's an image, of course, of his own betrayal, right? And uh, then um, we see on the left side here, we see uh, Dismas, the good thief, who's shown on the cross, who's a thief. And, and, of course, he was tempted to despair, but then he entrusted himself uh, to God. And he, of course, Dismas heard the most beautiful words that you could ever hear in the gospel, today you will be with me in paradise. I mean, those are the best words, right? And, and then below, of course, we see St. Paul, who had been ferociously trying to destroy uh, the early church. Well, here he is, of course, falling off his horse on his way to Damascus to destroy the church. And there, the, well, therefore, he had been bad, but he converts, of course, we know. So the fame, the greatest convert of all time, really. And, and then uh, above uh, the dying man standing is this angel, St. Michael, who offers these consoling words. He says, Nequaqua desperes. That is, you should not despair by any means. Eh? Do not despair. Mm -hmm. uh, here is a, another woodcut that has, uh, well, that is quite simple. It's colored in, but it has, as you, if you look at it, it has the same elements like, like you know, St. Peter and and uh, it's colored, but it's somewhat, I suppose, somewhat crude. And, you know, the fact that there's a woodcut meant that it could be repeated and, you know, printed over and over again for many people and, and also at a fairly cheap cost. Right? And um, there are other variations of this kind of image. And uh, um, this one here, which has uh, two panels to it, um, is dating to about 1450. And this one shows, of course, a multitude of saints. So if you look at the, the left panel, this side, well, the poor guy, it's a pretty sad scene. On the left side, you see a king, look at that, you see a king kneeling and a queen kneeling, and they are worshipping on this figure in front of a, on top of a column, which seems to be a kind of a pagan goddess of some kind, just as some of the kings did in the Old Testament, right? Uh, and... Um, and so there are all kinds of nasty devils around this one. Uh, like right next to the, the dying man, there's this ugly devil saying, Fak sikut pagana. Right? In other words, do like the pagan. In other words, like those pagans that are, you know, the, these kings that are worshipping a pagan. So do like that. He's, he's trying to tempt him. Like, be a pagan, you know. Dude, be a pagan. And then... And then on the right, to the right, there's another mean-looking devil who's taunting him. Um, it's a, he's saying, uh, inter iste te ipsum, you know, that is, 
you will be among them. It seems to be pointing to those worshipping the, the, the pagan gods. That you will be, you know, inter iste te ipsum. You will find yourself among them. And um, but then there's one uh, who points down. And if you look here on the top, there is it says infernus factus est, or in other words, like you're done with. You know, hell is is done with. It. You're going right down. See, he's pointing down, right? Now the right panel is a little bit better. We see a whole crowd of apostles there. We see Jesus and Mary, but look, we also see just to the right there. We see uh, Judas there, who's there too, and seems to to be growing horns, whereas all the other ones have these. These halos, right? But right in front of the dying man, of course, is Saint Michael, the archangel, who consoles him. He says, "Sis firmius in fide." Be stronger in the faith. So that's the encouragement that this man needs. Be stronger in the faith. This man here has been, has conquered, and this was conquered. That is, he, he, you know, he's going to heaven. So, so this was very consoling for 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 people to see this. That like you can conquer the temptations of despair, right? And so. Of course, these manuals were important in, a, in an age in which death was always a possibility, like sudden death was always a possibility. These manuals would, uh, would have offered the living, as well as all those at death's door, uh, some hope, real hope for salvation. But only if they overcame their despair, they made acts of faith, made acts of hope, right? And uh, it's as though the, the church was inviting everyone to really abandon themselves to God's mercy, God's goodness, and to, and to convert ultimately, right? to help them to realize that the devil uh, wants to do anything to make us despair, but at the same time, the devil is limited, you know, in his power. Now, in those times, of course, you see, this guy's in his bed, and uh, he's not in a he's not in a hospital. He's not in a public institution of any kind. Eh? And it was not doctors who decided, uh, you know, that you would die, or or you know, make any judgment as to whether or not you should die, or you're worthy of death, or whatever. It was it was a private thing in the sense that the the individual might be told clearly that his time was near, or he himself realized that his time was near. And he would maybe announce it to his family. He would prepare himself. Eh? And always, of course, with the help of the sacraments. Eh? And he, he would face the pain, or she would face the pain, there, right there on their deathbed, and would courageously uh, work his way through his sins, confront them uh, with the chance, uh, you know, to repent up until the very end. Right? And this is, that really dying with dignity that is dying with courage right to face the reality of one's death and in other words not to despair and today people might see these things as macabre uh, but of course in a in a time in which faith was omnipresent eh, it really helped people to contrition it helped people to have confidence in god eh, and that the battle was going to be theirs until the very end but at the end of course they would uh, they would be victorious mm-hmm. but now you'll notice that in all these images of course well see joseph is not present yet right and uh and so devotion to St. Joseph had not really uh, taken off yet at that time, but uh, soon it would make its appearance in different devotional manuals. From what I can see, among the first to speak about uh, St. Joseph was St. Bernard of Clairvaux, the founder of the Cistercians. And, well, he already started speaking about the exemplary role of St. Joseph in the history of salvation. Um, but then devotion started with... Uh, somebody like St. Bernard, and then another 15th century uh, theologian uh, whose name is Jean Gerson, and uh, this is during a time of great uh, social unrest in uh, in France, and in par- particularly in Paris, and he produced some of these texts, and uh, well, he was a scholar, educator, and reformer. Uh, it would seem that during some of the up- upheavals uh, in Paris, he took refuge uh, for like two months under the vaults of Notre Dame uh, Basilica there, the, the cathedral, and uh, like he eventually escaped, and he he attributed his escape to uh, the protection of Saint Joseph, right? So, which was, I mean, it was not it was not a common thing to invoke Saint Joseph at that time, definitely Our Lady, but um, and so 
uh, he was one of the first to go against the traditional iconography of St. Joseph, also as an old man, uh, you know, instead of showing him strong uh, and vigorous, right? But I, I just want to be uh, focusing on St. Joseph and uh, the patron of a happy death or a good death or a peaceful death, right? There are many images of him now appearing, but I'm going to just focus on that. Uh, the other figure uh, that comes in now that is important is uh, St. Bernardine of uh, Siena, and he presented St. Joseph really of example, an example of the guy you have to have re- refuge to when you're dying, right? And he would uh, emphasize St. Joseph's uh, obedience in his vocation. He he really wrote a lot of beautiful things about uh, St. Joseph, and it's after that uh, that Pope Sixtus uh, the Fourth. Uh, instituted the feast of Saint Joseph eh, and started more widespread devotion to to Saint Joseph. As during the 16th and 17th century, uh, devotion to Saint Joseph started to skyrocket, skyrocket, uh, especially I would say with the plagues that came back in the 17th century. Uh, there came back this renewed desire to uh, foment the art of. Dying, dying well, because many people were dropping like flies, you know, because of these plagues. And this is where St. Joseph comes in as an example of one to have recourse to uh, during this, uh, these plagues and, you know, to have a happy death. And, um, and so it's traditionally believed that St. Joseph died before the public life began, because he's, obviously he's never present during the public life. We don't, at least we don't see him in the scriptures. And of course, most of all, he is not present during the key moment of the crucifixion, right? So, of course, he would have been present at the crucifixion had he been alive, right? And uh, he also would have presumably taken care of Mary, but our Lord entrusts Mary to, to St. John, right? And St. John to Mary. So, uh, that wouldn't have fit if St. St. John had, uh, St. Joseph had been alive. And, uh, so, so now, okay, so there's the plague, there's greater devotion, uh, to St. Joseph. Now, what is the first image of St. Joseph, uh, in the, the, the image that is of the, the death of Joseph, right? Which is only a tradition now. It's not in the gospel, obviously. Well, well, according to uh, Elizabeth Lev, uh, this is how it it happens because she wrote a book on Saint Joseph uh, in art, a beautiful book that I recommend, and uh, she wrote it for the year of Saint Joseph. Well, she says that the first uh, picture of the death of Saint Joseph did not appear until the end of the 16th century, and they were. Well, part of course of this church's concern to, for this special moment of death. And, um, well, you know, they thought, well, who else could better prepare us for death than, uh, Saint Joseph, since he was accompanied by Mary and Jesus. I mean, that, like, talk about, you know, you know, amazing accompaniment eh, that would encourage you. So people thought, yeah, well, St. Joseph, he was accompanied by Mary and, and, and Jesus. I mean, that you can't get better, uh, accompaniment than that, right? So, and so uh, there was a Spanish Carmelite whose name was Jeronimo Gracian, eh, or Gracian. And he wrote a book about the life of St. Joseph. And it was an interesting book. And this dates to about 1596 or so. And it was accompanied by a number of engravings. And I just draw you here to one of these by an engraver uh, called Cristoforos Blancos. And it's he did a whole series on the life of St. Joseph in there. We see, of course, um, what's presumably the first one showing the death of Joseph. Eh? And that's kind of like the first model where we see uh, Joseph, well, lying there in bed. He's departing uh, because he's, he's kind of half despairing because he feels that he hasn't really been up to his task, you see. And uh, especially... Uh, since his responsibility was to take care of such incredibly holy uh, creatures like like Mary and well and, and Jesus, right? And um, we see Jesus in stark profile, giving him this blessing. And in the text below, it says, "Mors bona jans justa est lux ergo pieta Josef cum sponsor." Cum sponsa et Christo sic bene pia moritur. Well, Latin meaning meaning a happy death is the war reward of the just. See, a happy death is the reward of the just. 
How great then is Joseph's reward as he dies so happily with his spouse and with Christ. So, you know, the the happy death, a peaceful death, a, a, a death in which you are happy to face it. You know, th- this comes with the just man, right? and, and G- Joseph was called the, the just man, right? Probably this is the first major painting, right, of the death of Saint Joseph. This is a beautiful painting by the artist Jacques Stella uh, from the 17th century, f- from you know, uh, 1596 to 1657. And uh, he was probably the first one to tackle this at a large scale. And this painting here from 1655 is in the Museum of Grenoble in France. And look, okay, so look at this painting now. See, look at the ashen figure of St. Joseph. I mean, look, he's, he looks like he's really dead compared to the, the vibrant colors of, uh, of Jesus there, the skin at least. He's lying there in his rather small looking bed covered in this gray sheet and he looks like he's literally in a kind of a tomb eh? but you see below on the left we see the instruments you see of uh, the carpenter that he was his workbench and um, though he is looking very ashen he looks at Jesus with such hopeful eyes and look you see Jesus is pointing to himself saying I am the Savior I am the way I am the life and uh, See, the Lord is wearing red for his human nature and blue for signifying his divine nature. And Mary, however, she's in the back. She looks kind of sorrowful, um, just as she would later be the sorrowful mother at the foot of the cross, right? But she's praying there. And then, of course, on the left, we see these sweet poses of these angels that are praying, Gabriel and Michael. And uh, it's as though... Gabriel, to me, Gabriel seems to be saying, remember me? We, we talked, remember in your dream? Uh, we, we, we. Well, it's, I'm the same one, right? And, uh, and above, of course, the heavens are opened and the light is coming in and there's more angels and one gets clearly the sense that he's going off, right, for his uh, reward. Now, you'll notice this is a horizontal painting. That's one of the first, as I say, this one from France by Jacques Stella. But then probably one of the most important paintings that later gives... Well, uh, uh, you know, it has a big influence is this painting by uh, Carlo Marratta, uh, one of the leading painters of, in Rome. If you look at it, very vertical, it was commissioned by the Empress uh, Eleonora Gonzaga in, in Vienna, and um, she was part of the Habsburg family. And that family had a great uh, devotion to St. Joseph. Um, and so he did, uh, this guy, Carlo Morata, did another painting of this uh, in the Church of St. Isidoro in the Marmartine prison, just next to the Roman Forum, if you've be- ever been there. Uh, but this painting is really the probably the most iconic one because it's, well, it's 12 feet high, and we are at the foot of the bed, and we see, again, the discarded tools of Joseph on the floor, and he's now wearing a, a yellow mantle that becomes a color that he's often shown wearing or, or, you know, covered with. Mary sits at his side in kind of peaceful contemplation. And um, the lesson here is how family members should surround the dying, right, to help them confront death the death of a loved one and um, they can be present there by praying by encouraging right and uh, indeed uh, the Ars Moriendi the art of dying at that time has a chapter dedicated to what the family should do in these circumstances that is they should not despair they should not go into hysterionics or freaking out or you know but to protect the soul uh, from all these distractions that are secondary but to help them face death and here of course this beautiful painting you see Jesus in profile and of course you can see uh, Joseph looking up to heaven and look he's looking at all these angels waiting to, to, to take him up and one one of them seems particularly excited telling the others you know like the one the, the ones beyond him who is coming right and um, I would say that that one there top left there I would say he's probably looking at uh, at God the Father, right? And uh, who is not present in the painting, but he, he's like off stage, right? And um, there's also on the left side there this marvelous uh, incense that is gently moving up to heaven. That's the, of course, the symbol of our prayer moving up to heaven, right? Um, and so 
This painting helped to teach the faithful uh, not only to accept death, but also to minister to the dying prayerfully, quietly, and, and peacefully. Right, and it, so it was a, eventually uh, set up in one of the chapels there of the Empress, and um, it's in this. It's in the vast. Uh, uh, castle there of of the empress and um, and within that it was in one of their their chapels that's where it it stood but the other area that this is very present certainly is in mexico in this period there's one famous mexican uh, artist his name is miguel cabrera and he well he was recognized during his lifetime as one of the greatest painters uh, in new spain in mexico and he created both religious and secular art he produced a number of very beautiful paintings, like this one here. Uh, uh, some of them would show uh, Jesus leading Joseph to evangelize the new world. And here, of course, uh, Jesus is consoling Joseph um, at his last moments. This is a very beautiful and tender painting here. Um, and here, I think this is one of the first times I've seen this, but the, you see these angels uh, coming down to crown uh, Joseph, and there's also the the other angel below with the sword, the lily, lily, which is a symbol of his chastity. And, but he's in a room, and uh, the place is just billowing with heavenly clouds. Uh, uh, it's as though heaven now have, would have entered on earth. Right. Another another painting that I really love a lot from uh, Bolivia, which is unique because, um, well, it does show. Uh, Joseph reclining in bed and he, flanked by Christ and Mary. Um, but um, here, of course, we begin to see uh, that God the Father now has entered into the scene together with the Holy Spirit, right? So there were paintings also of showing the, the Trinity of Earth and the Trinity of Heaven. Um, you know, the Holy Family, like Maria would do that. But here it's the dying Joseph uh, together with Mary and Jesus. That's the Trinity of the earth, and above is the Trinity of heaven, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and of course, uh, God the Son on earth, kind of connecting the two, right? And, um, and so, uh, he's very feeble here, of course, and, uh, but he's recognizable, recognizable, and, um, you know, there's this, um, image of, uh, uh, of Jesus touching Joseph, it almost looks like he's taking his pulse, right? He's going, oh, uh, yeah, okay, your pulse is still good, you know, and, uh, and, uh, what's also unique about this, of course, is that it's uh, presented, uh, outside, right? Uh, which is rather unusual, and, um, it, it, it just shows the beauty, uh, uh, and the, uh, the sort of peace of nature kind of, uh, both in its majestic landscape side, and, uh, it just, Kind of lends a kind of uh, narrative, the, the narrative, a sense of timelessness and 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 profound peace. Uh, I would say, you know, with uh, nature. So these kinds of paintings continue, uh, and with time, the iconography starts to stabilize, if you like, and even becomes kind of popular, like this Francesco Palazzo. Uh, this is from uh, a church in Brescia, and uh, it's called the Church of the Collegiata dei Santi Nazaro e Celso from 1738 and uh, well it was planned for a side altar and this too uh, is quite beautiful the setup is a bit different but you see it's the same basic setup with Jesus standing there pointing up and there's a kind of upward movement this billowing uh, yeah, clouds and the angel below he's on a kind of a dais and um, you know so it, it kind of becomes standard. Now, when you go to as far as the eight, 19th century, um, well, the, the death of Joseph appears um, at many side chapels in churches of various kinds. And you have this guy here, Ballerini, who was active in Rome in the first uh, half of the 20th century. So this is now more modern. It's a softer palette. And, uh, you know, Jesus now is in a white alb, and uh, so it's slightly different from the traditional uh, colors, but lots of movement of angels again, right? And uh, so there are many of these. Uh, but I would say um, one thing that happens after all these paintings is uh, paintings now are uh, decorated uh, with uh, stained glass, all right? And many, many, in the, especially in the 19th century, there were, for example, uh, uh, you know, companies like in, in Munich that became very, very famous for their stained glass. 
I wanted to mention one of the uh, one of the great um, churches in Montreal, which you may not be familiar with. It's really one of my favorite churches. It's called Saint Leon de Westmount. So it's in Westmount. I think the church was f- originally built around 1902 or so. Uh, but this uh, artist from Italy came in 19, I believe it was 1924 that he came, and uh, he dedicated his whole life to this church, pretty much. I mean, he did many, many other churches, but that became like his masterpiece, uh, this church of St. Leon de Westmount. And uh, it's got a lot of beautiful frescoes, it's got lots of incredible stained glass. And uh, one of the chapels that I particularly like um, is the chapel dedicated to St. Joseph. It's got a beautiful marble statue of St. Joseph, but on either side there is um, well, there is uh, stained glass of the death of St. Joseph above, right? Um, but below is this marvelous representation uh, which, honestly, I haven't seen this. I may may exist, but I haven't seen this elsewhere than this. It's the, the death of the just man. So that's put next to or, or just below uh, the image of St. Joseph dying. So here we see um, uh, we see uh, a young person dying in bed and of course the priest coming in to anoint him. There's a candle there and there are presumably these relatives weeping. Uh, it looks quite like a child that is dying, especially at a time, no doubt, when infant mortality was quite high in those years. And of course St. Joseph well, he could also be occasion of uh, of uh, consolation, right? So uh, this this church, if you ever have a chance to go there in Montreal, it's on Green Street there in Maisonneuve. Beautiful, beautiful church, uh, very clean, and and it's really his masterpiece because it's the frescoes are amazing, the the marble work is amazing, the stained glass is insane, and you can see on the right side you'll see that. Uh, that little chapel dedicates St. Joseph. Another church in Montreal that you're no doubt more familiar with is St. Pat- Patrick's Basilica, uh, which was built in 1847 for the rising uh, um, amount of Im- you know, uh, Irish immigrants that was uh, coming into Montreal in that time. And they came in great numbers, largely due to the famine that, that was existed in uh, Ireland. And uh, so this church, as you're probably familiar with, is this Gothic revival church. And I had forgotten about this, but I, I remembered that I had baptized a number of people in front of this painting on the side chapel there. Uh, and it's a painting to dedicated to the death of uh, St. Joseph. Now, I only have this rather poor uh, photo of it, but uh, you can see here, um, you know, he Jesus has his hand on on Joseph's shoulder and at his feet, uh, his feet again are exposed. Eh? He's kind of like the working man. He's tired out. He's had a hard life in the sense, the hard labor. And uh, Mary on 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 the right is kneeling on this kind of little footstool, but she's looking quite young, right, for for Joseph. So this is a kind of an older looking Joseph. And above, you can see the glorious Joseph in the. Uh, interceding now for the other with the other saints, right? And that's that's in the sanctuary there of uh, Saint Patrick's. So this this image of Saint Joseph became more and more widespread, and you could see it in all kinds of holy cards uh, and uh, so forth. And I think it became very very common. Today, the world uh, tells us that a happy death or dying with dignity is one where we manage to escape uh, suffering and pain. But for us, for Christians, for Catholics, suffering is not something undignified as such, right? It can be, it, we can sanctify suffering and pain. Eh? And not only that, but it can purify us. Eh? And of course, we know Jesus died in the most horrific way, but it was also the most dignified because it was freely accepted as a path uh, to redemptive atonement uh, for for our salvation, right? Uh, there were also many other beautiful stained glass uh, uh, examples, for example, this is a, a huge cathedral uh, that was renovated fairly recently in Covington, Kentucky, and um, it was modeled on uh, uh, Notre Dame Basilica there in Paris. And the bishop of that time, Camillus Mays, was uh, the man who conceived uh, the windows and designed, uh, well, and the whole design and presided over the installation, right? And uh, so, as you can see here, it's uh, it's quite a, a beautiful stained glass, you know. But the whole church is filled with the stained glass as well. Right? But it also reflects the deeply rooted uh, 
uh, devotion there to St. Uh, Joseph. But I want to just finish um, with this uh, painting uh, by uh, a Maltese painter, um, Anton Inglot, uh, who died in 1945. He was a, a prominent painter at the time, but he died quite young, unfortunately. And uh, he had quite a lot of output. And you'll, you'll see here in this church in uh, Malta, uh, it's kind of very uh, monochromatic palette uh, that sort of radiates a kind of otherworldly aura, uh, a kind of sobriety and uh, a spirituality in this. You see, it's different from the traditional representations of the death of, of St. Joseph, right? Uh, if you know Di Chirico, that's the artist who would have influenced him. He was a, you know, a... Um, Italian surrealist, uh, or they would call it futurism at the time, and they were kind of uh, preoccupied with what was called then arte metaphysica, sort of kind of, uh, some would call it like theosophist, it's a kind of a spiritualization of nature and making everything kind of uh, uh, timeless and a certain stillness as we can see here in this uh, painting of the death of Joseph, right? And the, the palette is very subdued and, uh, well, as we say, gives a kind of uh, metaphysical, you know, aura to it. So I hope you've liked uh, some of these paintings and some of this, these works of art. Uh, I, you know, I suppose uh, there's still many, many I could uh, pull up. Um, but, you know, remember, if you see another painting uh, of, of a scene that is not present in the gospel, you know, it's important to see how this reflects the didactic and um, ascetical concern of the church eh, for the people of God eh, so that they can really write, so that they can really uh, prepare themselves for that most uh, fundamental and sacred moment uh, in their life where they're about to meet their Creator eh, and that they can actually sanctify the, the pain, the hardship, uh, and, the, and the loss, uh, you know, of, of what we've always held dear, our, our own life. So I, I hope this has been a help that, uh, that uh, can help you to, to sanctify your, your very important work in that moment of death that you experience.